Hi, thanks for coming today. My name is Jessica Todd Harper, and I'm here to talk about my recent book, Interior Exposure. Um, I'm a photographer. The book is a collection of photographs. And it features uh, portraits of families, um, chiefly my own family. And so this talk is about how I ended up with the present body of work that I have today and um, how I started using my family and other people's families as well as uh, inspiration for my artwork. Um, I mean, obviously, we all photograph our families, and I take snapshots of my kids and, um, and my other family members. Um, but I also use the camera in uh, a less conventional fashion. And here, I'm starting with an image that I made when I was about 17 years old. Um, this is a family portrait with my father in the center. And it even includes a self-portrait, uh, the, the adolescent there fading into the window on the most left side um, is, is me. And, uh, and I, I always enjoy this picture because I think that's kind of an appropriately self-conscious stance for a 17-year-old. Um, you can see I had some younger cousins who really didn't want to be part of the portrait. So uh, this one here on the right-hand side is, is, has his back to the camera because he didn't want to be a part of it. And my family is, is staying very still. It's a long exposure. This is black and white film. Um, it, it's probably about two seconds long, and it's shot into the light. So that's what gives it this grainy, uh, um, kind of scratchy feel. Uh, and I like that in retrospect because it says a lot about the, the way that memory works. We remember um, some details, but not all of them. And there isn't a lot of specificity in terms of the details of this picture, but you have a, a general sense. Um, two other things that I, I like about this picture in retrospect are uh, the, the mirror um, behind us and also the, the photograph there in the upper corner, which um, references a, another time completely. Um, from the early 1900s. So I photographed my family a lot when I was a teenager. This is my sister, Becky, who you'll see a lot in years to come, and my father. Um, well, my parents, again, with my younger sister running off in the, the background. And again, this is my, my sister and our cousin, Sybil. Um, you might notice this picture looks uh, a little funny. It's photographed with infrared film. Infrared photographs uh, slightly below the surface of the skin. I remember two of my teachers in high school, when they discovered this, they commissioned me to do a portrait of them. Uh, they were in their late 50s, and they said, you know, slightly below the skin, that means no wrinkles, right? So um, they had these really wacky infrared portraits of themselves on their mantle. I went through a stage where I was kind of addicted to it. It's insta-cool, right? I mean, it makes everything look neat and different. Um, and it's kind of hard to walk away from that once you discover something that, you know, you don't have to necessarily make really great pictures. It just makes them really interesting for you. One of my main influences uh, back, again, when I was in high school is uh, an artist called Sally Mann, who maybe some of you might have heard of. Um, any of you who were around in the 90s, I know this is a pretty young crowd. Um, in the early 90s, she became pretty famous for a collection of work called Immediate Family. And in this, she photographed her young children, um, and they were often naked, like uh, her daughter Jessie there in the foreground. And they assumed kind of adult um, personas. Um, so here, then this child is six years old, but the way that she's standing and, and her confrontation with the viewer is a very adult uh, presence. Um, she has an ownership of the space that uh, has, gives her a sense of authority, um, even though she's a small child. And that's something that I was really interested in, even if I wasn't very conscious of it as a teenager. Um, this is a portrait I did of my cousin at the same time. She's a kid, but she has this kind of authority, this sense of ownership of the space. Another big influence was a photographer called Julia Margaret Cameron. Um, for those of you who aren't 25, this is always a nice uh, story of inspiration. She was given her first camera on her 51st birthday. Um, and she's uh, arguably the most famous photographer of the 19th century. Um, she was British. And uh, she had her servants pose for her a lot. Um, she was part of the aristocracy. So they were just you know, there as, as subjects, um, you know, whether they wanted to be or not. But she had some really great looking servants. Um, and, and this is uh, one of them. And 
um, this, this sense of uh, uh, kind of otherworldly mythology that she brought to her pictures was very different for the time. The camera um, in the 19th century was seen as this interesting um, scientific discovery. You could uh, document landscapes. Um, you could document, you could inventory your, your vase collection, um, and you could have like an, an Insta, um, a very small portable uh, copy of that. Um, I mean, here she was using photography to try to make it look like art. This looks a lot like the pre-Raphaelite paintings of the day. And this is a, a portrait that I did of my sister. Now, I mean, I, I'm, I'm putting these together 15 years later. Um, I don't think that at the time I, I, I was uh, thinking consciously about my influences, but I know that these things kind of sit in your, in your brain and, and they come out. When I went to college, um, I continued to photograph the people around me, and they weren't any longer my family. It was uh, the people who lived in the dorms with me. So this is before a dance um, at various stages of readiness. Um, as you can see, these are all freshmen, uh, a little nervous and maybe uh, a little grumpy about all having blind dates um, for a dance. <laughs> this is a self-portrait um, with a, a college boyfriend. Um, and this is my family again. This was in the summertime. Um, and, uh, and here, you'll notice that some of the figures are moving. This is a, a very long exposure. I like to use natural available light. Uh, I don't use flash. And so most of the time when you're indoors, in order to afford enough light, you have to keep the shutter open for a really long time. So people move. Um, and one of the things that I, I like about that feature is that the people who don't move become all that much more uh, important to the composition. So. And the main important person in this picture is, is my cousin Sybil, who's there in the middle. Um, and so the focus is her. It's even though she's among this kind of public space with other people moving around, it's also a private picture because it really focuses on her and, and her interior world as you have you know, life moving about around her. And I also, one of the things I really like about um, about photographing people in their homes is all the debris of domestic life. I mean, you have kind of crumpled up napkins and um, the, the flowers are falling and there's, there's petals and, and kind of mess on the table. And, and then there's all that stuff in the background to look at. And, and I guess being kind of a naturally nosy, curious person, I, I like the voyeuristic aspect of, of those pictures. Um, this is in uh, Arizona. This is a dude ranch where um, my family has vacationed for a long time. And um, this family here that's in the middle of the picture also uh, vacations there. She's uh, a very powerful New York Magazine photo editor. And um, this is an 11 second long exposure. So it tells you, I didn't tell her I was, I was photographing her. Um, so just the fact that she's in focus just tells you how in her own mind she is. And she was completely still for 11 seconds while everyone else in this dining room area was busy getting their food and talking and moving. And so um, I really liked the sense of, of privacy that this picture had, even though it's in a public space. You're very uh, focused on, on the interior world of, of this individual. When I went to graduate school, um, I started working with my grandparents a lot. All four grandparents were in Rochester, New York, and that's why I chose to go to RIT for my graduate work. And my grandmother at the time had severe Alzheimer's, and she was losing her sense of identity and um, uh, who I was sometimes. Uh, but she was very often um, reminded of, of who she was and who her family members were by context, so being at home with things that she remembered, if she touched things and handled things, then that would kind of help her to, to get a handle on, on present reality. And I started making these pictures uh, with her and me together. So this is, um, that's the two of us in that mirror. And then it's, we're surrounded by all these photographs from the past. Um, this is my grandfather's uh, dressing table mirror. So um, my grandmother is, is in the mirror as this old woman, but she's also there as a 12-year-old girl and as a new grandmother holding me when I was a baby, um, as a bride. And so there are these different aspects of, of uh, in these different phases of our life. Um, this picture was actually used to illustrate a story in Newsweek about Alzheimer's. Um, this is another portrait from that time, my grandfather uh, on the other side. Um, now, 
I know you guys having this reputation for being really techy. Um, I, I'm, and, and I know I'm, I'm an artist, and this is an artist talk, but I'm, I'm going to try to explain all the techy stuff that I can cram in here. Um, so I'm going to show you the first picture I ever made a digital uh, compilation from. And this was during this time when I'm working with my grandmother. So I made this portrait of her. This is film. This is photographed with a Hasselblad. Um, and then I, I took this picture of, of uh, her, her mother's childhood home. And, and, I, and I put her in it. I mean, I know this isn't, you know, beautiful. It's not in my book. But this just um, is an example of, of the first thing I did. And um, so I, I cloned the, the nightgown so that it went down longer. And then I, I inserted my sister in the background there under the tree. And she acts as this um, kind of witness to this uh, event that's happening. And the way that my grandmother is, is uh, kind of off kilter. She doesn't look naturally in that position. I mean, A, it's because of my poor Photoshop technique, but B, um, it also uh, goes along with this theme of her not being, kind of being haunted by memories, not at home in, in her world. And, and then having this third person kind of looking at us adds to a, it adds a layer of self-consciousness um, to the whole experience. Uh, the, the fact that we're looking at this as being witnessed by somebody who's looking at us. I'm not the first one to use this technique. Um, in the 19th century, this is a painter called uh, Manet. And um, he would use this, this witness character sometimes in his paintings. Um, so here you have this portrait of this young man in the front. He's the best lit. He's in mo mostly the center of the composition. So it would seem that he uh, was the central character of this image. But the servant in the background is looking at us. And so it, it adds this layer of, of, um, of, of self-consciousness to us looking at the picture. And uh, it's this very uh, provocative, interesting um, compositional uh, tool. Um, this is another image I made of, of my grandmother, who's off on the side there. And, and having her blurry and off to the side is significant, because she is um, so frail with, with her mind. And her mother is, is depicted above her um, in the painting. And then her granddaughter, uh, my cousin, is, is next to her. They all have the same name. I liked this picture, but I found I liked this one better. Um, my sister, again, is acting as this kind of witness character. She's watching the relationship that's happening between um, you know, this, this, this uh, triangle composition of these three women named Sybil. Um, I, I like, uh, I like the, the juxtaposition also of having my blurry grandmother, this very young but, but dead uh, great-grandmother there, and then this very alive and focused um, younger version, uh, the youngest Sybil in this composition. Um, my sister uh, kind of often uh, is put in this role in, in compositions of my family. This is my gr grandmother on the other side, um, and she's with her daughter and then her granddaughter, uh, my sister. And Having her bracketed um, on both sides by these two generations that are younger than her uh, is also visually reinforced by the way that uh, my sister's body, you see, is, is visually connected to the body of my grandmother. And then you go up um, her shoulder and across, her sh across where her neck is, and then you follow her arm to the other side, and it's connected to the chair on which my aunt is sitting. So even though th these women are, are very much in their individual spaces, they're also visually connected, and that references the um, the blood connection, too. Um, this picture is of my aunt and uncle. It's just from last year. Uh, but my sister, you'll see, is, is peeking out from behind the flowers there. So uh, there are four people, or four characters in this picture. I mean, the principal actors are my aunt and uncle, but there's the dog, this uh, French bulldog gremlin-looking thing there. That's the black uh, thing on my uncle's lap. And then my sister is kind of watching you from the flowers. So. Um, it's just a, it's a bit of a surprise. And a lot of times in my pictures, the title is very important because you don't necessarily know what you're looking at until you read the title. Uh, this is another early uh, experiment with um, digital manipulation. This is the original picture. My sister is about 18 years old here, and um, my father is doing some work of some sort, and she's kind of curled up there in front of him. Um, and I, I was thinking at the time about um, the, the story of Pygmalion. Um, so this is a, a 19th century painting um, uh, that shows the, the story. It's an artist who falls in love with his uh, sculpture. And the sculpture turns, uh, comes into life, um, you know, becomes real, becomes a real woman. Um, this is a, another creation story, the one that you might be more familiar with. It's, 
it's God creating um, Eve out of Adam's rib. And so uh, this, this scene you see a lot iconographically um, throughout the history of art, this nude woman kind of emerging uh, fully born as this adult um, um, from a, a reclining figure. Um, so I took this other picture of my sister, um, infrared again, because I still hadn't gotten rid of that addiction at that point. So this is black and white infrared. Um, and I added color to it. Um, and, uh, and, and changed the, the color balance, and I put the shadow in in the background. Um, and so I had this, this kind of metaphorical picture of, of uh, it's kind of a coming of age portrait, this you know, woman being fully, you know, emerging fully grown um, from a reclining figure. So it's, it's a little bit about her being on the cusp of childhood, um, kind of nestled in the parental embrace, but also um, you know, being on the cusp of adulthood too. So, but you know, it, it's funny when you take these pictures to critics, you have all these ideas and intentions and, and that's great, but um, you know, people see what they will and, and as an artist, you really have to let go of your pictures and let people see what they will. But I remember a couple critics looking at this in portfolio reviews and saying, oh, this is uh, an analysis about her weight problems, right? You know, cause she's on a scale. Um, I, I hadn't even thought of that. I mean, it was just <laughs> completely incidental. Um, yeah, so you, you never know what people are gonna see. Um, another one of my heroes, this is uh, Jan van Eyck. Um, he's a painter in the 16th century, Northern Renaissance. Um, so it, it's interesting when you look at the Renaissance in the North, uh, it's very different from, say, the Italian Renaissance. And they really painted action. We had blood, we had um, gore. There's wonderful biblical stories and historical myths. There, um, there's a lot going on. And, and in the North, they're, they're painting these portraits of very stern looking people, um, kind of turned to the side, using natural light um, in interiors. And, and there's really nothing going on except what's going on in, inside. These are kind of more psychological um, interior studies. And uh, I was an art history major as an undergrad. And um, these Northern European painters became a, a really big influence. Um, this is another painter, Sofinispa Anguissola, um, as her, her name will betray. Uh, she is Italian, but she paints um, in this style. And, and you'll see also that, again, you have this uh, kind of physical reserve, um, the way the body is turned slightly away from the viewer. And even the child here it has that same um, physical presence. Um, another painter you might recognize, Vermeer, uh, made these wonderful domestic portraits. Um, Again, we're not talking about mythology or important historical events. He just made pictures of people in their homes. And um, he often had these, these curtains there off to the side. So you have all that much more of a sense that you're walking into a private moment. You're being a voyeur. Um, and then you, you, know, you have all the details of their life there in the background. So you can go and think about their painting and, and the piano there and you know, what their life might be like. Um, this, uh, this is a photograph of mine. And, uh, these are our family and friends who are just trying on um, dresses. But um, again, that, that the way that the body is kind of slightly turned away from the viewer, you have a, a sense of, of privacy um, being conveyed there. Um, and again, in this picture, this was at a, a cocktail party in um, Pittsburgh. And I knew the host, but I didn't know this woman until that night. She was the host's girlfriend. Um, but the sun was coming down through the window like that, and she had just had that great dress on, and I just knew I had to photograph her. And uh, my friend, uh, Patty, who's there in, on the left-hand side, is about eight months pregnant. Um, and so she's there on, on, on one side, and then on the other side is, is the host of the party. He's exiting the picture. He's going downstairs um, on the right. And I always thought this, this picture was interesting in retrospect because the next morning the host broke up with his girlfriend. Um, so there's, you know, there's a, the sun is setting in this portrait and it's also setting on their relationship. Um, although I didn't know it at the time, but I found that to be kind of an interesting addition to uh, this very kind of private psychological portrait of this woman. Um, this is uh, Hans Holbein the Younger, uh, another painter from Northern Renaissance. And you see he's got that kind of slightly turned away body language. But you see all the stuff he has um, in the background. There's just there's so much stuff to look at, all these little things. And that was really important to Northern Renaissance painters um, because those things acted, uh, they were just as important as the primary uh, figure because they, they buttressed the, the element of the portrait. 
Um, and so I really love it when stuff is around uh, for my pictures. This is right before my parents um, are leaving for a trip and they you know, have their clothes all around, they're packing, and my sister is working on a scarf that she's knitting for her boyfriend. Um, and I, I, I love uh, the, the backlit nature, the way the light's coming in. I like the mirror, I like to use mirrors. Um, I didn't know it at the time, but now I look back and I see that there are mirrors in so many of my pictures. I can tell I, I like it, I can admit that now. Um, and one of the things I like about the mirrors is I think that they act as, as metaphors for other spaces that you can't see. They're, they're um, along with windows, I mean, they're, they're spaces that, that reference uh, uh, realms of our existence that aren't necessarily there in the physical world. And I think a lot of the, the pictures that I'm trying to make are, are very psychological. They're very much con um, focused on the interior world of the mind, um, thus the title of the book, Interior Exposure. Um, this is uh, another portrait of my sister and my mother taken in the living room. And um, I did a few things here digitally. Um, this is the final image. And you can see I, I took out the white um, paint there on the, the left side, just because visually it wasn't very additive. And then on the coffee table, I just brought in a little more of the information from another negative so that you could see more of the stuff there. And the principal action of this picture is this portrait of, of this mother embracing her daughter. And you know, the hand is moving because she's kind of just absentmindedly stroking her hair while she does this crossword puzzle. Um, but I, I like that you can see the remote control and these magazines on the coffee table. Um, and this picture was taken in January 2002. Um, that uh, New Yorker cover on the coffee table is the one that was printed right after September 11th. It's black. Um, so there are uh, kind of subtle references to things that are, are not safe, um, but yet she's in this kind of safe uh, embrace, parental embrace. Um, there's a, a nativity scene there on the right and a star. These are other signs of, of hope or comfort. But um, juxtaposed with those are you know, this creepy doll of my grandmothers who was there and, and my great, great, great aunt Chiana who, who looks creepy. I mean, she couldn't help it. She didn't have any teeth when this was painted. But, um, but the portrait is nonetheless uh, enough to you know, it, it's, it's not necessarily comforting. It's a little strange looking. So I liked that combination of things that are comforting and, and, um, and also slightly portentous. Um, this is another family portrait from just a couple years ago. It's Christmas Eve dinner. Um, and one of the things I like visually about this, in addition to all the visual cacophony with the Christmas cards and the, um, the table full of plates and, and, and cutlery, is in my father's arm there, you'll see that gesture is repeated by my mother at the end of the table, and it's also repeated by that relative in the painting way back in the other room. So you have this um, connection that stretches across generations, even between the living and the dead, um, which is something that uh, we often think about and during holidays, and people who are no longer with us. Um, just to give you a sense of what light can do, this is the same space, but it's, uh, it's lit very differently. This is at dusk. Um, the last picture was an eight second long exposure lit entirely by the chandelier and candlelight, so it's very orange, very yellow. Um, this picture, my sister is walking around in a wedding dress at night because um, this wedding dress she bought for about $2.50 when she was in third grade uh, from uh, uh, these nuns who were raising money for the school and um, and, and so, uh, you know, she insisted that she had to have this dress, she would be married in it one day. So she found it in the back of her closet and she tried it on to see if it fit her adult body and, and so she's walking around. And, um, and I, I loved the juxtaposition of her in this wedding dress um, in this very um, old-fashioned environment. Uh, my, my mother was an antique dealer for years, so there's lots of antiques in the house. Um, and then also my husband who left his pants and his belt draped over the dining room chair there and there's that plastic bag in the foreground and then there's a little post-it note stuck to the antique clock. So you have these influences of, of modern life and modern informality um, uh, at the same time that you have these very traditional uh, formal references. Um, this is the same room as my sister again um, in front of, of that painting. This is lit entirely by uh, daylight, though, and um, you can see that the color and the feeling is, is different. Um, 
also having uh, my sister there in front of the painting the way that it is, although they don't, those two women don't really resemble each other, it's an implied connection. Um, people often say they look like each other, but I, I think it's just that the pose is such that you, you are um, kind of forced to, to make that connection. Also, it's a self-portrait. I'm sitting on my husband's lap there, right um, behind that Easter tree, um, which is in the center of the table. And um, this is kind of a, a sub-series, which sometimes has been shown separately in galleries and museums, um, of just uh, this marriage story, these uh, portraits of, of me and my husband. Um, this is one of the first ones from that series. It's called Self-Portrait with Christopher and My Future In-Laws. And uh, as with a lot of my pictures, I have the camera on a tripod. I'm using natural light. It's a pretty long exposure. Um, and it's with a self-timer. So I just set the camera up, and I walked into the picture. I didn't tell anyone what to do. Um, I did it once, and, and it worked out. Um, and my in-laws, who I think are trying to be very good, so they're sitting very, very still, um, come across as being, you know, really severe, right? And and uh, and what's and I'm just kind of standing there, frozen. And so the picture works because it's about um, my feelings, uh, my self-conscious feelings about entering into a new family, and will I make a good wife, and what does this mean, and. Um, and, and the only person who's relaxed is, is my husband's you know, body, which is very relaxed. And you can see in the mirror there, his face, he's smiling, he's confident, he's OK. But the rest of us just look like pff, a mess. Um, and you know, this is not, it's not a document. I'm not a documentary photographer. Um, but it's a portrait of, of what I was feeling like at the time. And my in-laws are, are so supportive of this. They've been to countless openings um, where this picture is, is shown. And you know they endure all kinds of interpretations as people decide to tell them what they think of this picture and what they look like and what it means. And um, you know, they've been very good about it. And this is another uh, picture from that series. So it's a self-portrait. Um, you know, my husband's kind of a secondary character there. But um, I, I, the context of the other things in the living room, there are other kind of icons of femininity. You have the Virgin Mary there on the bookshelf. There's a, a Frida Kahlo self-portrait um, also on the bookcase. Um, and then, you know, there's me. and I, just was trying to kind of figure out what it meant to be a wife um, and you know, to be married and, and what that was going to, to do to, uh, to me. And these portrait, these pictures also, when they're shown, they're 32 by 40 inches. So you really can go in and you can see these details pretty easily. Um, this is another uh, picture from that sub-series. Again, I, I set up the, the camera on an automatic timer, and I just walked into the picture. I didn't give instruction to anyone. My grandfather is kind of deaf, so he didn't, I mean, he was really natural. He didn't really even know I was taking the picture, and, um, and my husband just kind of you know, did what he did. So there's this, uh, this juxtaposition of these two primary relationships here, right? There's the marital relationship in the back, and then there's also the very important relationship of my grandfather with his Pekingese, um, who's in the corner there, and he's feeding him a piece of bacon. So there's a, they, you know, he's very focused on my grandfather. It's a very intense relationship. Um, again, you know, weird interpretations. I, I remember showing my portfolio to um, this one curator, and after I was finished, he said, well, you know, I, just, I think there's too much violence in your work. I, I don't think we can show it because it's too violent. And OK, people have objections to my pictures, but violence isn't one that I'd ever heard before. And I said, what do you mean by that? And, and he flipped back to this image, and he said, look at the way that man is holding that spoon. You know, he's going to stab that woman. <laughs> so again, interesting little tidbits. This is another uh, self-portrait with my husband. And this was chosen for the cover of the book uh, by the publishers. Um, and there's all this tension there. There's obviously a uh, sense of intimacy between these two figures. But you don't know if, um, you know, if they're about to fight or if they are uh, you know, actually you know, just very intensely involved. Um, and you know, there are those wonderful knives in the background. And so, but yet they're kind of, you know, sharing this piece of fruit. And, and so, um, you know, it, of course, publishers always want the sexiest picture that they can find. I mean, and there's nothing that provocative in my portfolio, but this is what they chose as the, the one to get people's attention the most. And again, um, I, this picture was just set up on a tripod and I walked in. Often I take these pictures where I set them up on a tripod, walk in, and, and they look stupid, and they don't work at all. But, but sometimes they do. I try not to repeat it too much, because then the subjects start to get self-conscious, and you lose the veracity. And though I'm not a photojournalist, and these are not documentary, I want them to preserve some truths of everyday living. So you can't pester your subjects too much. Um, otherwise, it doesn't work anymore. They look more like victims than um, characters. 
So um, also in the book, I include portraits of other couples. This is a, a friend from college. She's eight and a half months pregnant. And, and this is in Manhattan. So in Manhattan apartments, often everything takes place in one room because that's all there is to the apartment. And so my friend is uh, changing after a baby shower, and her husband is practicing the cello. And so I, I caught this look of the way that you know, he looked at her. It, it's this wonderful combination of awe and fear and love. Um, uh, it's their first child. So, uh, and the way that she just so physically dominates the space. I mean, she's just, her body is huge in this picture. Um, and he's, you know, kind of underneath, you know, crushed by her, her presence. So, um, and, you know, this is kind of a little bit of a study of, of what it might feel like to be a potential parent and, you know, the unknown that's ahead. And I have to say, I have really, in addition to having cooperative family, I have very cooperative friends. And my friend actually, Alette, let me have this picture of her blown up 32 by 40 for all of Manhattan to see um, earlier this spring. So she's, she's a good friend. <laughs> um, this is another pairing. Um, this was actually an accident. It's two pieces of film. I'm not sure what happened, but sometimes accidents are very happy. And um, this is the way it came out on the contact sheet, and I really liked it. There's, uh, my mother is kind of walking in on, on that side. Um, and then this is in a, another country, but um, you know, for all intents and purposes, it's in the same picture here, um, of this woman in the rocking chair with just a man's legs there. And so it, it's, it's kind of a mysterious image. And, and you have this you know, woman who's kind of walking in, Hearing in, so um, um, I, I just I liked that, and it's kind of neat. Uh, this is another couple. Um, they they live in Germany, and uh, one of the things that I like about this again is all that domestic litter in between them. You have the car keys and the remote controls and the newspapers, and and in between them all those portraits of their children, um, which connect them both in their life, of course, in real life, but also visually. Here, um, you have that line of pictures which connects him to her, and their body language. Again, you don't. I, I, a, a reviewer actually wrote about this image, and I thought he said it really well that. Um, you don't know whether they're about to fight or fall in love all over again. And um, you're trying to photograph a marital relationship is a very complex thing. We, we might go to a, a, a studio and, and have a very smiley, nice, happy picture that we send out, say, on Christmas cards. Um, it's that kind of your public presentation of what your, your marital relationship is like. But I mean, anyone who's married knows that, that you know, the intensity and the intimacies of everyday life um, are very, it's a very complex uh, thing. So I try to make these pictures also have uh, you know, many different layers um, that describe those different aspects of the relationship. Um, this is a, another relationship. It's my cousin and her boyfriend there um, in the middle with her mother in the foreground. Um, I guess appropriately enough for this audience, she's engrossed in her computer. Um, and one of the things I like about this picture is that all the triangles, you have this triangle of her arm in the foreground, and it's echoed by my cousin's arm there. And then in the portrait in the background, the figure is also um, has this triangle with the arm going down to the, um, the chair that she's leaning on. And, uh, and so you have this kind of connectivity between these, these individuals um, who aren't relating to each other at all in this picture. They're very much in their isolated spaces, but visually, uh, it, there's illustrated a connection. And, uh, and I love you know, the sense of ownership kind of on, on uh, the way that um, Will, the boyfriend, is, is, has his hand on top of my cousin's abdomen. Um, he's like, he has this very intense, kind of private feelings there, which are also going on in addition and separate to the relationship that um, this main protagonist, my cousin, has to the viewer, to the camera. She's looking at me. We have this own thing going on. But he has his own thing going on. And, and uh, my aunt also has her own thing going on. And that's often the way that we uh, relate to each other, even when we're all together. We all have our own individual agendas and ideas that are preoccupying us. Um, this is another pairing of my, my aunt and my sister. Um, this is before getting ready for Thanksgiving. Um, this is a, a friend from college who's a, a resident um, in the ER at Johns Hopkins. And so and she's very exhausted looking, and she has a, a baby here. Um, this is one of the few pictures where I used strobe lighting. It was raining outside. I didn't have any natural light to work with, so I used artificial light. And it was wonderful because the flash so startled the baby that he really paid attention. He has this wonderful, um, intense gaze, uh, which, which normally doesn't happen with small children. They're just crawling all over the place. But I, iconographically, too, that pose, he just looks like a little baby Jesus. 
Um, there's that, that ugly French bulldog again of my aunt and uncles um, with, with my cousin. And this was uh, the afternoon after my grandmother's memorial service. And my cousin's walking around in my grandmother's old nightgown. And, um, and she picks up this dog. I, and I, I, I like, and this is one of the few pictures that's taken outdoors, but there's still a sense of intimacy um, nevertheless. I like the way that the beam is kind of coming out of her head there. It's probably one of the elementary things that you're told not to do if you're taking pictures of your family. But here, what it does is it kind of anchors her visually. It makes her all that much more firm and, and fixed within this um, composition. Um, this is an example of, of a kind of completely constructed picture. I, I saw this room with all the light in it. I liked it, and I went and got my sister and brought her up there. So she wasn't just reclining here. Um, I was reading A Tale of Two Cities, which is on the bed. Um, but, uh, and I also, I put a pillow under her hips there so that her, the shape of her body would all that much more echo the shape of the mountain range behind her. Um, and uh, there was a, a red and black plaid blanket in the bottom corner, but as you can imagine, that didn't add very much visually, so I got rid of that. Again, uh, this is not something I thought of at the time, but later, when I was preparing this talk, I thought of this postcard that I had in my college dorm room for four years of Modigliani. Um, and I can't imagine that that wasn't somewhere in my head when I came up with that composition of my sister. Gustave Lachaise is another artist that um, has a very hippie women um, who are very uh, uh, st kind of strong and grounded um, in their space. And um, that's one of the things that I really like. Going back to that picture of Sally Mann who photographs her children, you know, the children are very, um, have a sense of ownership in the composition. And um, here, my sister, the way that her body is posed, she has very much a sense of authority um, with the viewer. And, you know, my, my husband and my mom have their own thing going on here, but she's very focused on us. And one of the things I also like about this is you, you may have noticed there are a lot of portraits of ancestors in the pictures. And um, here, she's blocking out the ancestor totally. So it's kind of, it shows the uh, kind of the confidence and the energy of the present living generation and it's that much more important than the, the dead people that you uh, eclipse. Um, and just to remind you, there's that Sally Mann image again of uh, her daughter Jessie. Um, this is another um, artist who was a strong influence. Uh, my mother used to bring me and my sister to uh, museums when we were little to entertain us on rainy Saturdays, and we'd have to sit there and copy paintings. And, um, and although I found it was kind of annoying at first, I grew to really love this. She first gave us crayons, and then she would give us charcoals, and then when we were old enough, we got pastels, and we'd sit there and copy paintings. And, and I, I copied a lot of Impressionists, in particular John Singer Sargent here. Um, this is a, a portrait he did of a mother and her two daughters. And one of the things I really loved about his composition as you see, I mean, the portrait is of the mother and two daughters, right? So why didn't he chop off the picture like halfway down? Why is there all that other space there in the top? And you see um, other paintings of other people there kind of in the darkness um, and other suggestions of the background. But uh, he included so much of that. And um, I think part of what makes this, this composition so strong is the way that these, these people have a relationship to their space and, and in kind of ownership of the space that they inhabit. And particularly painting women like that um, at the time was uh, sometimes unusual. Um, and in my compositions, I can see that there's a, an influence there. Um, it's a little more sketched together and haphazard. I mean, here the dog walks, walked through the composition in the middle of the picture, but it ended up working. Um, there's this connection between you know, my husband's hand, which is about to touch the dog. It, re it echoes the hand that my sister just kind of reached up to stretch. And so there's a relationship between these two figures, um, even though they're, they're not physically connected. This is another image of my sister with my mother. And um, again, there's this strong relationship between them and the space that they inhabit. Um, it was uh, wonderful luck to get those two red chairs. It just happened to be matching the red shirt of my mother. Um, but you see, they, they combine, they work together to uh, kind of embrace the, the blue of the couch and my sister in the foreground. My mother is always saying, I, I really, I try to not digitally change as much as possible. And kind of the more I work, actually, the more I shoot just straight photographs. Um, but uh, my, my relatives naturally have complaints, you know, why can't I make them look, you know, thinner, or younger, or whatever, get rid of their wrinkles. And, and, and here in this picture, my mother is always lamented that I didn't get rid of the tops of her knee-high stockings, which are kind of peeking out there from her hem. Um, but I like that kind of stuff. I, I like the, the realness of, of life. And I, I try 
I mean, unless someone has an, an enormous zit on their face, which is going to distract from the rest of the composition, I, I try not to make little cosmetic corrections like that. Um, this is another painter from the 19th century, Cecilia Bow. Uh, I'm just curious, how many of you have heard of Mary Cassatt? Three, okay. How many of you have heard of Cecilia Bow? Nobody? Um, when I give talks at museums or more artistic places, um, most people have heard of Mary Cassatt. You probably would recognize her picture. She does a lot of pictures of, of children and mothers. Um, it was interesting, though, as Mary Cassatt uh, has a letter that she wrote to an artist friend where she laments that um, she would never eclipse the shadow of Cecilia Bow. Everybody pays attention to Cecilia Bow, and, and nobody knows who she is. And, and it's, it's very interesting, because now Mary Cassatt's very well known, and, and nobody's heard of Cecilia Bow ever. But I happen to seen an exhibit of hers when I was in college. And one of the things I really love about this painter is the way that her subject's hands are used. She, the subject is very absent-minded, but the hands are very alive. The way that the bottom hand is kind of interacting with the ribbon there in her lap, and then the top hand is interacting with this cat. Um, this is a self-portrait by Albrecht Dürer, who is a, a German painter in the early part of the 16th century, um, a friend of Martin Luther. And, uh, and this picture was a caused a little bit of a stir. Um, I'm just curious, who does it look like to you? Yeah, yeah, everyone gets that. It's Christ, right? I mean, even today, even then. And back then, it's not so much like the wiggly long hair would do it, because everybody had long hair, right? It's still, there's a sense of, of being kind of in the world, but also having, uh, being outside of the world, being somewhere else, this divinity, which is um, somehow portrayed. And uh, he was brilliant to be able to make this, um, you know, perhaps a little egocentric to make it into a self-portrait. Um, but he was a good painter. And I, I really like, um, I like that in pictures, and I try to be able to convey the sense of being in a space, but also being some, somewhere else, too. And um, this woman is a physicist. She's working in Switzerland now in CERN, uh, that particle smashing place. Um, I don't really understand what she does, so I, I, uh, I can't really explain it. But I know she's, she's working with... Um, with, uh, with particle physics and um, kind of the origin of the universe is what she's uh, preoccupied with. But I, and here, her way that her head is kind of vanishing into the background, um, it, it shows that she's, she's interested in, in the heavens, both in, in particle physics and also because of her religious uh, sensibilities. She's a Christian. She's also interested in the heavens in a, a spiritual sense. And um, in the bookshelf there, there's a novel by Virginia Woolf called The, the Voyage Out, um, which I think is is nice having that there in the composition. And although she's, uh, her head is kind of vanishing outdoors, she's also connected to this uh, beast-looking thing, who again is my very innocuous standard poodle. But um, here, because of the long exposure, you kind of see his fangs and, and uh, his teeth. And so he's, he's very worldly, whereas you know, she is very ethereal. He's, you know, she's also anchored to the world. This, this picture appears on the back of my book. It's a picture of my grandfather and, uh, and my sister. And, um, and I was interested in, my, my grandfather just passed away a week and a half ago, and one of the things I was interested in doing was, was showing what that, um, those last months of life are like. And he took a lot of naps um, and, during the end of his life, and, and so here he's, he's taking this nap, and my sister kind of curls up next to him, and he, he reaches over his hand and, and is resting it there on her hip, and it's this very kind of intimate, um, warm, enclosed space. But the window there, none of this is, is altered, but the window there, also it looks like it's, it's the way the trees are lined, it's, it's like a, a passage to somewhere else. And so I think of this as um, he's, he's there in the world with my sister in this particular space, but in his mind, um, and he, he could be thinking about past the, uh, his past uh, moments in his life or what lies beyond life, too. Um, this is a, a picture with my husband, which was a, a bit of uh, an experiment because I've posed him in a very feminine way. You know, it's a kind of odalisque pose that um, on his side, you know, with his, um, his hand up there on, on the side of his, his head. And, um, and yet he's this very masculine, hairy figure. So um, it's that juxtaposition of, of this kind of feminine pose, but a very masculine body. And, and also, I, I didn't light him. So you can see just enough to know he's there, but you can't see everything. And, um, and so this picture, although he dominates the, the space physically, it's also, um, if you follow the lines of, of his body and then, um, and then her gaze going out the window, it's also referencing uh, psychologically you know, where they, they might be elsewhere. 
Um, this is a portrait of a friend, that same uh, very tired looking surgical, uh, I mean ER resident. And this is when she was eight months pregnant and her husband was living uh, in a city two hours away at that time. So um, she has this, this otherworldly sense in this portrait. Um, the, her gaze being out and also the light playing on the wall is, is kind of, it's, it's symbolic of, of her mind just being elsewhere and, and having a, a lot on her mind. And this is the same woman um, with her child when he's about two years old. And, and it's nice here with children, the way that they're so animated, um, it makes her static nature all that much more uh, strong because he's moving around so much. And this is the last picture in the book. Um, uh, this is a, a woman, a German woman, with her three children. It's called Judith and Her Children. And, um, and having that baby, this intense look, he's kind of wondering what I'm doing, was, for me, just a little bit of a reference of what's to come, because um, the book came out this year. And, and also, arriving this year was a, a pair of, of twins, um, which I gave birth to earlier this year. So I have had the sense at the time, and it's proven true so far, that um, children will figure more and more into the work. One thing I wanted to um, add uh, separately for you, just because of um, because you're Google, um, I recently did this series uh, for Newsweek about women in leadership, and these are a couple of the the portraits um, there. But the one that that I wanted to point out to you is that Sheryl Sandberg there. Um, on the left-hand side. And uh, one of the things that the editors really wanted to do um, uh, using me was to uh, photograph these women not necessarily in their business spaces, but in their, their private spaces and their domestic spaces. And so um, I, I went to their homes and photographed them there. So. Um, and, and Cheryl was, and she was you know, very nice and very welcoming and, and very busy. And so I went there um, at like 7.30 in the morning and she was already on her laptop, you know, tapping away, tap, 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 tap. And so that's what she's doing here on this, um, on this chair with the early morning light coming through the window. And she looked up for just one moment and uh, that was, ended up being my favorite picture. And it's the one that, that they published too, because I, it's this kind of um, sense of, you know, what, what's going on in her mind, you know, the, the grand things that she thinks of. Um, and I wanted that, I thought that was more interesting than necessarily just showing her tapping away at, at her computer. Uh, and that's Rosario Dawson uh, next to her. Um, and that's it. I'd be happy to answer any questions. Um, it's a good question. The question is, how did I manage to train my family to be so inoculated against my presence? Um, I started early, I guess. You know, I've been photographing them since I was a teenager, and they know that the vast majority of pictures I take never turn into anything. So eventually they stop caring. Um, and they're very supportive of the arts. Um, so I think they understand uh, that artists have been using their family forever and that these aren't necessarily pictures of them as much as they're being used as characters in these compositions I make. Um, and I think, I think ultimately it's, um, I have to credit them with a certain generosity with, uh, and trust with um, letting them, uh, letting me, uh, letting me just use, um, use them and use their homes as, as backdrops, and, and other people, too, that appear in this book who aren't related to me. Um, they're, very, they're very trusting, and I'm very grateful for that. Um, it seems like a, a lot of your photos are almost like taken on the moment. But how, what percentage of your photos would you say you've already thought of the symbolism and meaning of the photo before you take me? Right? <laughs> it seems like you take this, this great photo, and, and then you see all the things after. So, like, this, this type of photography seems very difficult for me because, like, I, I can't see that I'm going to get anything out of this. And I take that photo and I have to find something that's incredible. That's a really excellent question. The question is, um, to what extent am I aware of various uh, symbolisms in the composition when I'm making the picture, or do I always see it after the fact? 
Um, and he added that that seems very difficult to go around thinking about um, iconograph iconographic references and symbols while you're trying to make a picture. Um, I couldn't agree more. I think um, I try to work, as I had mentioned earlier, I try to work fairly quickly, and I try not to be too much of a pest. Those are kind of the two rules, because when I break those rules, um, it not only do I annoy the people around me who I have you know, emotional investment with um, just if they want to keep on being my models, um, but I also don't make good pictures if they get too irritated. Um, so I think a lot of the stuff that's going on, uh, this use of symbolism, um, you know, interesting props, it's mostly subconscious. I don't necessarily think about it very much beforehand. Um, like that picture with the, the novel, The Voyage Out, um, on the shelf, I, I didn't see at the time. But I saw it afterward, and I thought that was neat. Um, so I think the more that you do this, too, the more intuitive it becomes. It's kind of like speaking a language. When you talk, you don't necessarily think about all your grammatical constructions or how intelligent it might sound um, or how stupid it might sound. You just kind of say it. And and I think with with photographs, too, I just kind of stumble along. And, and of course, I only show you the good ones. Do you use natural light exclusively, or do you ever dabble with uh, artificial light too? The question is, do I use natural light exclusively? Um, for the most part, yes, I try to. But um, when I'm you know, being hired by magazines, for example, um, you can't make the weather cooperate. And so I try to schedule times, which are at the beginning or the end of the day. Uh, but I also bring an assistant with a whole bunch of lights, and we recreate it if we can't make it happen naturally. And there are a few pictures that I showed you from the book where I do use strobe lighting if it's just a very dark space. But it's so um, laborious to set up the lighting and, and to have it uh, there that you, it's harder to get that sense of naturalness. Yeah. You always have the camera ready for picture Do I always have the camera ready for picture taking? I wish. There's so many times when I don't. And, and you know, by the time I get my film loaded and my tripod ready, people have totally moved on and they're not interested. And, sitting for whatever I thought was cool, um, particularly now because I have 10-month-old twins and um, they never stay still and it's becoming a real challenge. I, I'm having to work in a new way. Um, I try to have the cameras set up more and then I keep them behind little plastic fences so they can't get to them. Um, but uh, no, I mean if I worked more with a 35 millimeter camera, uh, maybe with a Leica, something that's a little more handheld and portable. But I, I work with a tripod and a medium format camera, and, and there's a cost there. It's slow. So what, what technological improvement in the last 10 years has really helped you? It really doesn't change what you've done. What technological improvements have there been in the last 10 years that have really helped me? Um, as I mentioned, I got my master's at RIT, and uh, one of the reasons I chose that is because for photography, there's nowhere else that has better equipment. They have everything, and they have support staff to help you, and it's all cutting edge. And um, when I was there, I mean, this is cutting edge technology. This is what the best that was available. But I was still working with these two, two and three hundred meg files, these pictures that I show you, because they're so large and they're, they're many layers, and um, they're 32 by 40 in their final output. And I'm really concerned with quality and detail. And so I used to work there late at night. I would get like three computers at a time. I would sign out, and I would, you know, open one file, and then I'd, you know, open one file on the second computer, and open another file on the third computer, and then I'd have my book with me because I'd have to wait about five minutes for them to open. Um, and I would use you know, separate machines because the computer couldn't possibly handle three files at once that I was working on. And I mean, I didn't know any better, so I guess you just put up with it. I would bring a novel with me, and it was just long. Um, it's so much faster now, so much easier. Uh, and the scanners have gotten much cheaper, too. Um, and when I was in grad school, I was able to use really nice scanners there. But um, now it, it's affordable for me to scan at home and, and make good scans, too. Uh, so I think that's, that's probably been the biggest change. I still don't have a digital. There, there are digital cameras which are good enough to mimic um, film, medium format photography, but they're uh, you know, $20,000 at least. Um, and I don't own one of those. So uh, that's what I'm waiting for next, is a digital camera that has the same quality as film. Anything else? Yes. Just 
the question is what percentage of photos um, are taken candidly and how many are constructed? Um, I constructed more early on because I, I kind of wanted to see if I could, and I, I digitally um, combined negatives more than two. Um, now I, I try, I've moved back more to straight shooting, kind of an old fashioned way of approaching it. Um, Again, because of those things that I, I've been mentioning, that your subjects get impatient with you. Um, I, I try not to construct too much. And now, with children on the scene, there just isn't time to construct anything. So, um, but because the children can't, you know, they're like pets, kind of. You can't tell them to be still. You can't tell them to look a certain way. I do find that I'm going back to blending negatives because often they look best in one image, whereas the adults are cooperating, you know, in all the images. So I. I can piece them together that way. Yes. Yes. Right, right. <laughs> the question is, um, since I shoot film and I use these really long exposures, how do I know that they've come out? Or um, is it just like rolling the dice? Um, I have to say, when I do commercial jobs, I always bring a digital camera and I test it. <laughs> because then I can see and they're paying me. Um, but uh, I still use really long exposures because I try to use the natural light. Um, film has this wonderful ability to, to still register information with really long exposures. Um, it, it's, it's, very flexible. It's a wonderful range in terms of for light and shadow registry. Um, but uh, <laughs> the answer is uh, often I don't get it. Um, although I've I've gotten. I mean I'm pretty good at, at just judging what the. When you take a picture, you have to take a light reading. You have to measure the light and then have your camera match those um, numbers. And so, um, but you're, as with all things, it's helpful to have a brain too to override what the you know the camera the measurements are the best. They do the best they can, but they don't really see the picture like you do. So, I, just with years of experience, I've just gotten a lot better. But I've made a lot of bad pictures. Is that it? So you've been a very friendly audience. Thank you.